Well, if everybody's set, hello everyone, and welcome to the first Fulbright Forum on Human Trafficking. I'm your moderator, Mitzi Perdue, founder of Win This Fight, Stop Human Trafficking Now. 75 years ago, Senator J. William Fulbright had a big idea. He wanted to create a positive impact on the lives of individuals, local groups, and global communities. That, friends, was the beginning of the Fulbright Scholarships. Today, honoring that initial vision, we'll be talking about human trafficking. It's one of the darkest subjects on the face of the earth, but fortunately, with increased awareness, we can rescue millions of suffering individuals from their traffickers, and even better, we can prevent countless individuals from being trafficked to begin with. According to the United Nations, 40 million people are being trafficked today. That's the bad news. The good news is we have new and impressive ways of attacking this scourge. Today, you'll be learning about what motivates traffickers, and you'll also be learning about their Achilles heel. Traffickers have a huge vulnerability and our panelists will tell you about new and effective ways of going after them. And at the end of our time together, odds are you are going to feel hopeful, energized, maybe even excited. We have three panelists who will be sharing information a new and effective ways of preventing human trafficking. And you'll get a further introduction of each one just before he or she speaks. But here's an overview of what to expect. The first person you'll hear from is Sarah Crow. She's from one of the most admired, respected, and effective anti-trafficking organizations, Polaris. And for a hint on her approach, it has to do with this guy. You'll learn what the connection is as soon as you hear her speak. Next will be Duncan Jepson from Liberty Shared. You'll learn from him some powerful economic tools for stopping labor trafficking. And for a hint, it involves one of the ingredients in this chocolate bar. And by the way, if you think what it is, mention it in the chat room. Our final panelist is Tom Hall from the financial institution UBS. The organization he represents has an outstanding record in using its philanthropic arm to support anti-trafficking efforts. And here's a hint about his approach. Ladies and gentlemen, it involves being a force multiplier. And when I think of Tom Hall, that's who I think about, a force multiplier. Well, before we start, a small bit of housekeeping. If questions occur to you during the presentations, please use the Q&A feature. On, on my laptop, it's, it's on the bottom screen, sort of towards the left, and it'll say Q&A. Ask your questions there. And now let's meet Sarah Crow. You've heard a moment ago that Sarah is with Polaris, the organization that administers the National Human Trafficking Hotline. In addition, Polaris holds the largest known data set on human trafficking in North America. Sarah Crow heads the Financial Intelligence Unit. As you'll soon see, she and her colleagues have the ability to attack trafficking in two extraordinarily effective ways. First, they can make it less profitable. And second, they can make jail time more likely. Sarah, please start by giving us an overview of human trafficking. And during your time, please explain why there's an Al Capone connection to what you're doing. Sarah? Thank you, Mitzi. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, so human trafficking, what we're talking today um, about is people being made to work against their will or made to engage in commercial sex or what's commonly known as prostitution against their will. Um, so this is situations in which someone would not be in that situation, they would leave otherwise, but there's some kind of force, fraud or coercion that's being used that keeps that person in the situation. So 
um, you know, maybe they're being threatened um, with some kind of physical harm or um, harm to their families or a harm like, you know, if you quit this job, I'll make sure you never get a job in the industry again. Um, other times it will be maybe a form of debt bondage where someone is in debt to their employer, um, maybe associated with travel fees, uh, initially coming to a country for a new job. Um, and they're then in debt to their employer and they're told they can't leave until they, they pay off that debt. Um, so it can take a lot of different forms and it can also involve anyone who's under the age of 18 who's engaged in commercial sex or prostitution. Um, in those situations, you don't necessarily need to prove that force, fraud, or coercion exists um, because those individuals are too young to consent to that activity. So Mitzi really hinted at kind of our big strategy here and our approach uh, to addressing this issue, um, which is this Al Capone strategy of addressing human trafficking. And what I mean by that is, you know, Al Capone is somebody who was involved in a lot of criminal activity. For those of you who don't know, he was a mafia boss who kind of eluded uh, prosecution for a long time. And the government really struggled to bring a case against him that stuck. He was kind of high up in the, in the organization. He would order uh, criminal activity to happen, but he wasn't necessarily always doing you know, that activity himself. He wasn't necessarily the person to shoot someone, but he might have ordered it, that sort of thing. Eventually, the government pursued a strategy of um, going after Al Capone for tax evasion. Um, and he did receive a very significant sentence uh, that really was not possible when they were pursuing kind of other types of, of investigations against him. So maybe that's not the ideal situation, but in, in many instances, financial crimes of this investigations can bring accountability to people who have been previously able to act with very little personal risk. And that's what we're trying to do uh, when it comes to human trafficking. And a reason I think this strategy is so important for human trafficking in particular is that traditionally criminal justice approaches to human trafficking um, put tremendous pressure on victims to cooperate with prosecutors to testify. Um, and that's a very tricky thing. You know, victims are people who've experienced tremendous amounts of trauma. They're, you know, kind of trying to go through a healing process. And having to participate in a human trafficking investigation and prosecution can be uh, very disruptive. It can go on for years. Um, you may be repeatedly interviewed and have to kind of repeat the details of your abuse again and again. You may um, you know, be put on the stand and up for cross-examination. And there might be somebody who's trying to pick holes in your, your story or question your credibility. Um, and for a lot of victims, they're really not necessarily in a place where that's something that they're willing or able to do. Additionally, many victims come from segments of the population that have not been traditionally always treated very well by authorities or come from countries where there's a lot of distrust for authorities. So that could be people of color, it can be immigrant communities. Um, there are many reservations about participating with law enforcement investigations. Um, particularly when it comes to sex trafficking as well, many sex trafficking victims have been arrested by law enforcement previously for prostitution that they were forced to commit. And so, you know, there's some real distrust there of law enforcement because they have not always been seen as a safe place. Sometimes they've been somebody who's um, actually arrested them and, and caused other issues for them. And so, that's where uh, you know, financial crimes investigations and this approach can really come in. When you pursue a financial crimes approach, suddenly the burden on the victim is lessened. Um, victims who do come forward are supported. It's not just you know, your word against theirs. There's suddenly this documentary evidence that may support what you're saying. You have this big reputable financial institution in many cases supplying documents and information to support to support what you're saying. Um, and in other instances, when that victim isn't able to come forward or testify, that's where you can really pursue a financial crimes charge or charges 
that like they did with Al Capone um, that can still yield very serious uh, consequences. So um, finally, and when, when you're pursuing a financial crimes investigation, a big part of the work, you know, this is following the money is asset tracing. You're trying to figure out where those profits are going, um, where those assets are held. And those assets can be seized and returned to victims through the restitution process. So ultimately, I love that um, Mitzi referenced kind of the Achilles heel, because I do think a lot about um, kind of the poetic justice associated with, you know, many traffickers are motivated to hurt other people because of greed and profit. And I think there is some kind of poetic justice in using that information about their profit seeking um, to later hold them accountable and restore, you know, some kind of stability and support to survivors. I want to, I'm going to be like a lawyer who already knows the answer because I've heard you give it, but I'd love to have you share it with everybody else. And that is, imagine that you're eh, chief of police of a mid-sized American community, and you absolutely know that there's a trafficking ring going on. You know that because people have given you tips right and left. I mean, you're absolutely certain of it, but you can't do anything about it effectively because of the problem of reluctant witnesses. Okay, so I'm the chief of police and I come to you and I say, hey, Polaris, hey, financial crimes unit. I need some help taking down this trafficking ring and I can't count on the reluctant witnesses. What would you answer to me? You know, um, so that's where we start talking to um, law enforcement about pursuing a different type of strategy. So maybe looking into something like insurance fraud or tax evasion, um, and also really trying to think through what are what is the financial information that might be out there. So you have big financial institutions, they are obligated to report suspicious activity into this kind of centralized database. Um, so they may have reported quite a lot of suspicious activity about the people that you're concerned about previously, and it may or may not have kind of uh, filtered its way down to you. Um, and so kind of querying that database, seeing what information is out there, you know, that might give you kind of a different strategy to pursue. Um, and and th that's kind of a little bit of a different approach than I think a lot of uh, particularly local law enforcement have pursued previously. And share with us some information about, about who's actually working in the financial crimes unit. And I don't want their names. I want to know their areas of expertise. Um, uh, within Polaris, you mean? Within Polaris. Yes. Yeah, so um, we have a forensic accountant who uh, previously worked for several law enforcement agencies. Um, there is somebody who's an open source intelligence expert. So she, you know, really has this ability to find kind of any uh, little piece of nugget of information on the internet that you can imagine is out there. Um, you know, we have somebody who previously did a lot of uh, review of, of trafficking cases and kind of classifying and analyzing that information. And then myself, I actually started out by working on the US National Human Trafficking Hotline, answering the phone. Um, so I've spoken to many, many survivors and victims of trafficking um, and handled cases and tried to get them connected to support in their local communities. Um, and then, you know, kind of went on to, to do more kind of data analysis type work. So um, it's a little bit of a diverse team, but uh, we're all quite, I think, creative and um, really per love learning and, and pursuing new information. And so that's really useful when you work in an intelligence unit. Now, before I said I'm like a lawyer and I know the answer before I ask it, but in this case, I don't. I have visited Polaris. I love the organization. I love the people that I've met. And eyeballing it, I was, I was dazzled by what proportion of the people who work at Polaris are involved in data collection. Uh, talk with us about, like, is it 50%? Is it 10%? Because you seem to be extraordinarily strong on that. And then a follow-up question. And if you forget that I've asked the follow-up question, I'm going to remind you, why is data so important? Sure. So um, it's definitely been a huge uh, investment in, in terms of resources for the organization. So um, there's a couple of teams that are collecting and analyzing data in different ways. I would say 
uh, if you include everyone who's in, in the hotline, who's also playing a role in the data collection, it's probably about 50% of the organization. Um, ah, my so, guess was right, because yeah, eyeballing so, it, that's how it looked. Yes, great, very, very observant. And that was a really intentional decision based on uh, that the organization made. Um, knowing that human trafficking is a hidden crime, knowing that there's a lot of misconceptions about what it can look like. Um, sometimes there are these, you know, Hollywood versions of trafficking, uh, Taken comes to mind. Uh, very great action movie, not necessarily the most uh, accurate portrayal of kind of a, a, a typical human trafficking case, not that it couldn't happen, but um, a, not the normal situation we would see. Um, and so we really wanted to make sure that we were hearing from survivors and victims, their stories, their experiences, and learning from that and utilizing that information, not to kind of guess what the intervention should be, but to really try and understand what are those touch points um, and to kind of get past those misconceptions to really understand what was going on. And so there's definitely been a huge investment in uh, data collection and um, just data analysis, learning and research generally to make sure we are accurately representing what is going on and um, being really strategic and uh, efficient and effective with um, how we choose to act. And actually, I'm so glad that you got into the data part because our next speaker happens to be, I've talked with him several times and I know that he loves data. But before we get to Duncan Jempson, before that, if somebody wants to get hold of Polaris, they want to know more, they want to support you, they want to volunteer, maybe they even want to work there. How do they get hold of you? Yeah, so the best way to would be to go to our website, which is polarisproject.org. Um, also, if you're specifically looking for information about the National Human Trafficking Hotline, you can go to traffickinghotline.org um, as well. Well, perfect. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, our second panelist, the guy who's big on data, uh, is Duncan Jepson. He's the founder and managing director of a leading anti-trafficking organization, Liberty Shared. He teaches at Princeton, the National Defense University, and Georgetown University. Before his academic career, Duncan was a corporate lawyer in Asia, and he specialized in the investment and financial services industry. You'll be hearing from him some, some, some impressive success in using US law to disrupt the profits of forced labor. And one more thing, you'll be learning from him. I'm holding up a chocolate bar. Why there's a problem with this. And by the way, I love chocolate. Mm, I love it. But there's a problem with one of its ingredients. And there's also a solution. Duncan, please start by telling us about one of the most important tools for attacking the finances of people who employ forced labor. And in your answer, please include how the palm oil in this chocolate bar relates to human slavery. Thank Duncan, you. you're on. Thank you, Missy, for the introduction. I mean, there are at least three ingredients in that chocolate bar, well, that chocolate bar. I mean, there's, there is palm oil, there's sugar is another area of issue, and there is obviously cocoa as well. So, um, you know, chocolate confectionery has like a lot of other products has a lot of problems. You know, I mean, Sarah set it up very well for me. Um, you, to start with, I think it's important to separate sex trafficking from the use of forced labor in industry. Um, sex trafficking, exactly as Sarah said, it's quite specific in that obviously it's, it's an entire activity that is criminal. Um, it is, a lot of it is at least by organized crime or it is organized criminal activities. Forced labor, um, <clears throat> you know, really exists where you have, uh, it could be a, as um, exactly as Sarah said with, you know, forced fraud or coercion of a small number of individuals in a construction company, a contractor you might have in, in, in the US or as in other places. But, but you might also have, you know, a large number of people on plantations and factories, um, you know, fishing vessels, um, where simply, 
they are from vulnerable populations. They are maybe in poverty, maybe due to climate change, they found themselves vulnerable. Those are of course in their sort of hundreds of millions. We're not talking 15 people here, 20 people there. Those people, you know, in extreme poverty is, um, is what is it below, uh, you know, um, $3 and poverty below $5 a day. And, and if you, number of people on the planet in those situations are looking for extra work uh, to, pay their, to pay their way, to educate their children, provide food on the table. We, we, I think most of us on this call will know that. Um, they're vulnerable to, to uh, some sort of deceptive um, practice and they then get incorporated into global supply chains. And so the big difference obviously between sex trafficking and forced labor in this representation is because you have that, that, that convergence between what are our illegal and criminal activities of coercion, fraud and force of, of some type and then obviously making products that then go into the shops, uh, whether they're directly or whether they're intermediate products like palm oil. Um, you know, we, we chose to look at palm oil and, and the we as Liberty Shared. I, I was a general counsel across Asia for the ING investment business and then BNY Mellon. And, and it was in that that I started to look at in the 2000s, the two aspects of this is exactly as, as Sarah was describing is the, there's the flow of money um, and on the other side, because we were an investment business and, and one of the largest in Asia at the time um, was the flow of money to, to, to underlying businesses that might be using forced labor as part of their value chain proposition, um, as part of their uh, manufacturing process. And, and so the question is, is, what do we really know about what is happening on the ground? How can we ground truth our suspicions? Now, the first problem we've got is of course, even you know, uh, the, the global statistics on um, internet access, barely 50% of people on this planet are even on the internet. So the internet is a great place to look for white collar um, transactions and arrangements, but it is not a very good place to look and see what happened to vulnerable people on the ground. It is just not recorded. Um, and, and if it was, it might be used for appraisals and retaliation before anything else. So you've got a ground truthing problem. So data becomes vital in understanding who is doing what to whom for what. And when we started to look at it, we chose a couple of industries to look at, but on a structural level, we chose palm oil and we chose fishing because they have diametric opposite kind of attributes. Palm oil is sensibly two countries, Indonesia and Malaysia, therefore two governments, two currencies. It's a traded commodity, therefore there is a, a market, capital markets value to it. Um, they are lots, medium small holders all the way up to some very large businesses, which are listed companies. Um, and you can therefore understand what are the, who are the, who are the buyers? You know, what is the commodities market to that? And it's, it's, it's defined and it's definable. Um, fishing, completely the opposite, obviously both land and sea um, and the depth. Um, you have many different species, and I think they need to go more, but you have many jurisdictions and countries involved, um, and, and hun maybe hundreds of millions of people involved and directly in the fishing industry, not so necessarily in palm oil. So we started to look at that and think, how do you get data and intelligence? And you split data between big data, which is what everybody is used to talking about, and thick data, which for those of you who might come from anthropology background, um, and... Um, uh, one of the, uh, the anthropologists that I used to have on my team, he was a Fulbright scholar, but I don't see his name in the participants today. Um, but um, he, it was very important to have thick data and aim towards big data and to think about it in both those ways. Those people that are, you know, relying on purely quantitative metrics um, and indicators, obviously that's very useful, but it's not suitably ground truth. You need to have someone on the ground to look at what is happening to people and to the communities they are now living in and have come from and are trying to support. So that became fundamental to what we were looking at. And then you start to think, okay, how do we change that and what mechanisms for change exist? Now there are far fewer mechanisms for change than one would hope. And I think um, in a sense, when we, you know, when I, when I, when we, when I teach the teach about this, often students, uh, some students are immediately 
uh, lay blame at the door of capitalism, which is not entirely unfair. But one of the problems with that argument is, is that you know, when we look at modern capitalism, um, we don't find much in relation to accountability. We find a lot, obviously, in relation to the transfer of benefit and the accrual of benefit. Um, but we find very little in relation to accountability. And, and um, you know, uh, Adam Smith wrote about this um, himself. Um, um, it's an important part of, of where things um, begin and end. And, and so thinking about where corporate accountability of long supply chains exists, from whether it's from a transactional element or whether it's from an investment element, it's fundamentally important. And we don't find many mechanisms um, in the world today. Uh, Liberty Shared started in Asia, that's where I was based, and then it came, it came uh, westward, which uh, is a bit unusual. Most NGOs obviously travel east. And um, you know, we, we do work in Africa, and we obviously I'm based in DC now, so in North America as well. Um, not, the reason I ended up in DC uh, well, largely was because uh, the law enforcement and the Department of Justice here and Department of Labor and Commerce are very, um, very much committed to, to anti-trafficking and anti-forced labor in different ways, far more so than many other, many other governments are and also have the resources. These things are not perfect by any way, uh, but they are uh, very emergent and they have a lot of infrastructure and commitment to them. And I think that that makes them at the moment exceptional um, amongst any other jurisdictions um, uh, that, 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 are, that are available. So I think when we, we start to look at what possible uh, mechanisms there are, and uh, going back to Mitzi's point, is that we start to think about trade. And, and one of those is the mechanism of US Customs and Border Protection, which is to use um, uh, the prohibition this is kind of the Al Capone idea, um, uh, although not intentional, was of course the prohibition of goods coming into this country that are made by forced labor. Now, what, what we did at Liberty Shared, and I think we've probably pushed this more than anyone else, is that uh, you know, we looked at the palm oil industry and we made, um, we worked on a couple, but made a petition against one, signed Arby, the world's largest palm oil producer. And that was successfully, you know, the CBP do a parallel investigation. They take what we have and we give them and they investigate it themselves. Uh, that's a common misunderstanding that the petition leads to a ban. It doesn't, uh, it takes months. Um, eventually there was a ban on, and we, <clears throat> we, we leveraged that ban and we made a complaint to the Malaysian Stock Exchange and about the disclosure of Simon Darby sustainability. That, that was not received very well. And as far as I'm aware, that's the only real uh, stock exchange complaint there's ever been on sustainability disclosure. Um, and this is a really important point because anybody who's sitting there and thinking, that somehow the world is suitably progressive and advanced, that there are all these mechanisms and isn't there just too much being done, which seems preposterous, but some people believe that, um, you know, this is affecting global markets. We aren't anywhere close to creating mechanisms that will have any kind of real impact on vulnerable people's lives at present. And I've worked in the, in, as, a, as I said, as a regional council, one of the largest investment businesses for years, um, we're not close to that kind of, of framework of accountability. Um, we do work with Homeland Security investigations on seeking to bring criminal cases against corporations. And the reason we've been interested in that is because there have never been any. And so no corporation or brand has ever been held criminally liable. And, and we have a project going in the moment with the University of Chicago, right back to the civil war in this country. So you can't find a criminal case against a company for using slavery of any sort back to that point. And that's quite depressing when it comes to mechanisms of accountability and liability. So pretty much for the 20th century, this has been something that is very much on the side of benefit and um, advantage and accountability is extremely rare and very limited at the moment. And so using data and intelligence big data, thick data, uh, looking at the financial aspects as, as, as Sarah uh, is doing now um, and when we used to do, do with her um, and looking at it from, a, from other mechanisms, whether that be trade, whether that be securities, um, this is vitally important, but it is, is very emergent at the moment. 
And so unfortunately is the data and information because most of what happens on the ground is not captured anywhere. It is a very much a kind of global north, I guess, more middle-class experience to believe that you know, everything about us is on the internet. In truth, yes, perhaps for us, but for most people on this planet, they are talked of in the millions because as individuals, nobody really knows they exist. And what happens to them is largely uh, unknown as well. So I'll just finish there. I think that's roughly sort of 10 minutes. You, you're absolutely perfectly on time. And what an eye-opening vision you've given us of how big the problem is and what needs to be done and what you're doing about it. Thank you. Now, if somebody wants to know more about Liberty Shared, where would they go? Um, I will just put my email address into the chat and people can use that. That's easy. Well, you can go to our website, which is libertyshared.org um, and go from there. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Duncan Jepson. Our third panelist, Tom Hall, heads the UBS Global Philanthropy Services. And I call him a force multiplier. At UBS, he's advised more than 1,500 clients and their families on how to achieve their philanthropic goals. He connects donors with organizations that are working to make the world a better place. And fortunately for millions of people who are enduring modern day slavery, a major focus of UBS is combating human trafficking. And by the way, in the interest of full disclosure, I'm going to mention that I'm a UBS client and I switched to UBS several years ago in part because I learned at how effective they are in combating human trafficking. So Tom, let's start with, how did a wealth management firm like UBS get involved with anti-trafficking efforts? Well, lovely to be here, Mitzi, and also hear such such inspiring speakers who are who are in depth experts on this topic. And I have to admit that I'm I'm not one of those. I'm a, a global head of philanthropy at UBS, so we 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 tackle a lot of different topics. And actually, I say the reason we've got involved is it's basically in our DNA. We actually just announced our new purpose statement, which is reimagining the power of investment and connecting people for a better world. So we generally see that our core raison d'etre as a business, as a financial services company, is, is seeing how we can bring capital, ideas and people together to make the world a better place. And my specific role as, as global head of philanthropy is, is you know, working with 10,000 plus clients around the world who want to maximize the impact of every dollar, Swiss franc, or in my case, pound that they give away so that they really do change the world. And, and, and you know, we often use the sustainable development goals as a framework, as a way of kind of measuring absolute impact. But whatever topic we're talking about, we passionately believe that when philanthropic capital is invested in the right way, you can catalyze solutions to the pressing social and environmental problems that the world's facing from things like polio, which I guess we know is almost eradicated from the work of Bill Gates through to education initiatives, but, and even something as endemic as anti-trafficking. You know, I think sometimes it can be tried to say, well, we're going to end human slavery and anti-trafficking -traffic, anti issues in our lifetime, but, but why not have that ambition? Because even if we get halfway there, that would be much better than not trying. And, and, and it's, a, it's a morally repugnant issue, obviously. So there's that reason why, of course, you want to get engaged. And it's, it's broad, right? So 45 million people, depending on the estimates, in some form of slavery. I think, you know, 5 million girls in India alone in some form of sexual slavery. So clearly, you know, big problems to try and uh, tackle. But why should philanthropists care? Well, generally, I find the clients I work with, whether that's locally in the US or, or, or around the world, you know, they, they want to improve the human condition. They want people to live their lives to the full. And, and clearly to do that, you need to survive childhood. You need to be healthy. You need to be well educated. You need to live in a safe, clean environment, hopefully not too impacted by you know, climate change or some of those other issues that are affecting us today. But the one thing that will ruin the outcomes of a child, however, wealthy, healthy or well-educated is any form of abuse. So any systems where abuse is allowed to be pervasive have to be stopped. And, and, and listening to Duncan, you know, no one is pretending this isn't, isn't complicated and highly complex, but we do think there's a methodology you can apply to effective evidence-based philanthropy. And it, and it, you know, in some senses, it's quite simple as well as being highly, highly complicated, but it's really, you know, three things. It's got to be evidence-based, it's got to be catalytic and it's got to be collective. So just to unpack those a little bit by evidence based, does it work? You know, like we've all seen philanthropy that's 
that's well-intentioned, whether it's the mosquito nets that are used for fishing and poison the lake because they're deep impregnated, or even, dare I say, the trafficking program that's entirely focused on rescue, which of course is maybe great for the girl that's rescued, but not good for the one that's trafficked in her place. So, you know, we have to think systemically and, and really follow the evidence and, and, and listening to, you know, Duncan and just following data, data and, and, and evidence and using that to equip us with both how to do it, but also whether it's effective and working. But that's not enough because 45 million people, right? It has to be at scale. And this is maybe why you call me the, the leverage man, because I, I talk about this all the time. You know, it's, it's that idea of catalytic, uh, catalytic capital, right? So there is not enough money, no philanthropist. And I love saying this to the billionaires I work with. They don't have enough money to solve a problem on their own. In fact, no philanthropist altogether has enough money to solve any problem. Philanthropy is $2 trillion. The sustainable development goals need 25 trillion. So what does it mean? It means we have to be extremely smart about how we use philanthropic capital. So we need to invest in innovation, test it, prove not just what one organization can do, but the idea of a theory of change, a, a whole different set of organizations working across the value chain. And in trafficking, we often you know, talk about the, the four Ps, the prevention, protection, prosecution, partnership. We need, we need the best in class of all those organizations to come together and, and move the dial. And, and then collective is really then the call to both those organizations to work together, really working together to move the dial, maybe in a place, uh, in a location, on a particular type of the trafficking value chain, um, but also for philanthropists to work together. Because ultimately, if we don't have enough money and we have to use it catalytically, it's really important that when we do invest, we all invest in the right thing together so that we can we can we can get the maximum amount of impact from our money and then what we've seen happen in, in not just in trafficking but multiple other issues is when you demonstrate effective pathways to solving issues governments come on board other major foundations come on board they start to fund your model and you create sustainable systems whether that's your sustainable justice system or your sustainable community-led uh, civil society that can prevent people from being trafficked in, that, in the first place and we've all heard these heartbreaking stories of, of, of families who have their child recruited to go and have a better life in the city and end up as, the, as a sex slave you know it's just it, 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 those things have to stop but they have to stop at a systems level so that's that's what we try and do. We try and bring ideas and, and invest philanthropic investment opportunities to our clients. And we're hopefully, as you can tell, pretty passionate about it. Oh, I certainly sense the passion. And again, uh, the full disclosure, I am I am one of your clients and I talk with some of the people who are working on these. I mean, it's awesome. Uh, one of the things that I know about UBS firsthand as a client is that you're very big on measuring not just inputs, but also outputs, which seems to me that, that you know, there, there needs to be more of that. Talk with us about that. Yeah, so so I think sometimes, you know, we, we often see it in the charity sector, don't we? Isn't it brilliant the gala dinner raised $10 million? Well, I, is it? What did they spend it on? You know, <laughs> so that the idea that the input is the story is, is, is just not true, you know, and that's the difference between poorly implemented philanthropy and actually solving a problem, which is, you know, the output, what activities happen. So, you know, how many, how many new prosecutions ha have you had? You know, were the, the bad guys put in jail with the outcome? Has that really reduced the incidence of trafficking in a whole city? Did you do it at enough scale to, to really move the dial? So that, that idea of being focused on outcomes and then focused on outcomes at the right price is is, is a really critical issue. And, and one of the things that we've thought about the trafficking space, and I think Duncan, you were touching on this a little bit, is that, you know, in fact, you know, both, both, both uh, Polaris and Liberty Shared are, are, are Optimus Foundation recommended partners. If our, if our clients give to them, we'll do a 10% match. So, so this is about additionality. But one of the questions we've been asking in additionality is, you know, how could we rapidly try and move the dial? You know, because I uh, don't kind of listening, you know, let's be realistic. We're nowhere near solving this problem at a global scale. But could we find one type of trafficking in one location where we could bring enough capital, enough organizations that have the expertise to within, say, a five year period, end the systematic abuse of children, stop it, you know. So we did some research. We started to bring some clients together. They funded the research. We looked at Kenya. We looked at Bangladesh. And we decided that Bangladesh was the country where, you know, just trafficking, sex trafficking in particular with impunity, within 15 minutes, the researchers doing that evaluation study were offered a nine-year-old girl. I mean, it's just unbelievable by a taxi driver, you know, from the airport. So really shocking stuff, right? So, but that coming back to what Sarah was saying, that's just a function of 
there's no price to pay for offering that girl because the justice system's not functioning properly. Why is she being trafficked in the first place? What's the aftercare? Where's the partnership? Where's the government in, 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 this, in this whole context? So, you know, one of the collective ideas that we're working on is something we've called Justice, Hope and Liberty Summit, where we're actually hoping to bring enough capital. We're funding some of the biggest organizations in the world, like IJM and Freedom Fund, but also community-led ones who've never all worked together in the same place, different parts of that 4P process, bring enough money in. We're starting off with a couple million dollars, pilot small. Maybe it will cost us 25 to 50 to ultimately get to scale in that one country and, and end that problem. But our hope is that if you do that and you do that rapidly enough, you generate the outcomes, i.e. massive reduction in trafficking, the 80,000 children who are currently, you know, you know, what would you call it? Subsisting, you know, barely existing in a brothel. They're no longer there. You know, you can see that. You can see that outcome. It's real. The justice system is strengthened. They are self-sufficient in their ability to prosecute. That can then be replicated to other countries and other contexts. So that's what we mean by an outcome. It's, it's a real tangible uh, demonstration of the efficacy of philanthropy to prove that these issues can be solved when we work together in that evidence-based, catalytic and collective way. Is the Bangladesh effort that you're describing, is it in the planning stage or are you actually doing so it? We are doing that. Yeah, we start, we, we're literally in what we're calling year zero. So some of the organizations are setting up, but we've got all the phasing, uh, you know, feasibility study has been done. Um, you know, one of our partners, Justice and Care, is already working there. They've already built great relationships with government because, you know, one of the four P's of the, to the trafficking uh, kind of strategy chain is partnership, right? And partnership with government's critical. If the government's not going to help you and is open to you supporting them to strengthen their justice system and, you know, prosecute that taxi driver, but not just the taxi driver, the kingpin guy who's running the entire criminal network, you've got, you've got to do the whole piece, right? Close down criminal networks as well as, you know, really invest in, in strengthening civil society and, and the prevention side of things if they're not on board you're not going to you're not going to make progress um so so that that partnership piece is really important so we've actually already pre-invested in that over the last two years through our partner justice and care they built some great relationships they've built networks between um you know government organizations you know a, a, you know serious organized crime networks say between the uk and bangladesh and parts of northern india because look, this is a this is a fluid ultimately multi-billion dollar industry that you're trying to tackle. So you know, we're hoping to try and do that with a few million dollars, not multi-billion. So of course, there's going to be opposition, but th some of those pathways are critical. Yes, that program started. We actually also started um, longer ago in the United States, because we know that this is a global problem. Uh, another anti-trafficking collective in San Diego, again, working with lots of different partners, uh, particularly working within elementary schools, again, with the local authorities in place, really trying to... Um, again, identify a model where you can work on that prevention piece, because obviously prevention is ultimately key. If you can if you can spot and stop and, and not treat symptoms, you can prevent in the first place, then of course you can scale that as well. So, so, so these collective approaches can be applied in lots of different contexts, but the focus is, is always the same, which is trying to rapidly arrive at, at proof, what we call you know, outcomes, um, it, with, with a view to those being then replicated. Tom, I've got one other quick question for you. And then we'll open it up to everybody's questions. But again, as somewhat of an insider, I know that one of your emphasis is, is on sustainability, uh, that, making the programs sustainable. Uh, talk with us about that. Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, I think I think part of the fact, you know, when I mentioned the macroeconomics of philanthropy, if you've only got two trillion dollars and it's a twenty five trillion dollar problem, if you just make grants, they run out pretty quickly. Right. You, so we can't grant our way out of the world's problems. What we have to do is spend our money catalytically. So what does that mean? It means you have to innovate something and find a pathway for it to scale without the need for philanthropic dollars. Now, there's different pathways to sustainability. One is you have, you know, a systemic change, a policy change. For example, you, you invest enough capital to strengthen the justice system so the justice system operates without the need for further subsidy. OK, so you've, you've created the effect. Other ways of, 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 of getting to sustainability and therefore the non-reliance of philanthropic capital is for profit. A really good example would be philanthropic capital probably was one of the core subsidies into things like clean energy solutions. But those are being scaled through investment capital in you know, the big funds, the, the real business of, the, of a UBS, right? You know, investing sustainably, you can get a market risk adjusted return and make, make the world a, a, a greener, cleaner place. 
we, you can adopt that strategy today for a whole variety of things, low cost private schools. So you, you use philanthropic capital to incubate things that can become profitable in the future. So it's, it's a subsidy, really a risk subsidy. Um, but ultimately, the, the, the scale is going to come from, uh, you know, from investment. But there's a third dimension, which is, you know, a lot of issues are not investable. The, there's 50 million children who are not in school today under the age of 11. Maybe 15 million of them can get into school with a low cost private school where their parents can afford two dollars a day. But what happens to the other 35? They're too poor. Their families are too poor. The only route for them is, is a government education, a government funded education. But we all know that, that, that public money isn't necessarily spent on evidence, going back to Duncan's point, on the best possible things that really work. It's sometimes spent on political whim or it's, or it's spent corruptly. And you know, we worked in countries like Liberia where they're spending $100 per child per year on education and getting a 15% literacy rate. So one of the big ideas that we've worked on in terms of, 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 of sustainability and scale for philanthropy in general is this concept of moving public money away from this output based model. So you take the US, for example, we spend 800 billion a year on social programs. It's very output based. They're not necessarily measuring evidence and data in the way that Duncan or Sarah would understand it. In fact, we had two Treasury Department officials estimated that it was about 1% of that 800 billion was spent in an evidence generated way. We think that paradigm can shift. We think our public money, taxpayer dollars, should be spent only when it's been proven to work. So when the child's been educated, when they're more healthy, when somebody's, you know, being rescued from trafficking even potentially you could set up an outcomes contract there which actually creates an opportunity for public money paying for social benefits for social goods that also creates an investment opportunity so it means philanthropists or even investors can go and pick those organizations who can deliver those outcomes so they can they can fund the best school who's going to get the best educational results or the best health outcomes or the best anti-trafficking outcomes and those are the ones that will get paid in that kind of universe of outcomes uh, contracts. Sometimes these are called pay for success contracts. Sometimes they're called impact bonds. But it's it's the same concept. It's ultimately more accountable, more transparent public money, and it's it's one of the big ideas in 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 how we drive scale and and meet this funding gap. Because when you think about the budgets of governments globally, they are in the trillions of dollars. So if you can start to transition some of that into more effective, more accountable, more transparent spending, you can start to square the circle, and that is the kind of system change effect that catalytic philanthropy can start to influence. Well, Tom, I cherish your realistic approach to things, including the impact that finances can have. Thank you so much. If people wanted to know more about you or UBS or the Optimist Foundation, you can pick one. Where would they go? <laughs> when you go to UBS Philanthropy, if you just put that into Google, you'll find everything you need to know about what we do in the, in the, in the philanthropy universe and, and UBS as well. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. And now I'm going to ask some questions from the question, uh, the Q&A form. And one person would like to know, will you, will you please comment on the pause of Operation Talent? It's easy to be discouraged when our government has rarely seemed to prioritize human trafficking. Uh, who will take that? And I think I'm looking at Sarah. And you need to unmute yourself, Sarah, or somebody needs to unmute you. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I want to comment on that operation specifically because I don't know enough about why it was paused. I think uh, you know Reuters has put out some information about uh, there being maybe some logistical challenges with the operation. Um, I, I do just want to to say, I do think there's a lot of misconceptions about um, uh, who is trafficking people. Um, and I think there's some, I'm definitely concerned that there has been quite a bit of rhetoric around um, this notion that people are, um, who are immigrants who are coming to the United States are involved in these organized crime rings and are trafficking people. And you know, the reality of the situation is we see plenty of US citizens doing this. Um, it, it's happening all over from a lot of different populations. And so kind of linking immigration uh, too closely with, with trafficking, I think is not um, an appropriate association to make. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. We have a question for Tom Hall. Are you working with other anti-trafficking organizations? For example, the Mekong Club in Asia? 
so that's not that's not one that we're currently working with and and, and as with everything if I, I could i can pick a list of three things that are involved in strategic philanthropy and and i pick the three i chose today but but the one i missed out was probably focus you know and that idea that you, you know there's so many great organizations doing great things and if we just add resources to those organizations we're not going to move the dial so I think our focus, the things that we're really recommending is where we think we can bring things together to rapidly move the dial in a single location, because we think that that's the best approach to try and see replication and adoption by bigger money, i.e. government money, ultimately, um, some of the big international ag agencies getting engaged in this topic. You know, we've seen, um, you know, certainly you know, in, in the last administration, you know, big, big move with, with USAID starting to get engaged in the anti-trafficking anti space. I think that's been continued now. And that's really really important when it, and that wasn't happening before. Um, so, so I think that's that's why we started to focus. Interestingly enough, in the Mekong Delta, we are doing a separate collective on um, on, on coastal ecosystems and mangroves specifically, because mangroves are such an important role to play as a carbon sink. So um, we, 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 we do have different strategies in different parts of the world, uh, but not every strategy everywhere. And now let me move over to Duncan. Duncan, if you wanted to expand what you're doing, what would it take? <laughs> like I'm going to assume lots of money. If somebody were to write you a $10 million oh, oh, check, where I, would it get you? I don't actually think it. I mean, it, there are many parts of this. So someone wrote in the in the questions about, you know, what does it take? I mean, I, you know, I teach my team and I teach all my students that you have to think of it as a competitive adaptive system. It has got a lot of different parts to it and they're constantly moving and a lot of things happen are emergent and we can't prognosticate and say, okay, we're going to go after this thing and then this thing will cause that. There are no there are no proportional relationships between inputs and outputs in this because you're dealing with poverty, climate, conflict, you're dealing with failed agriculture, successful agriculture. You're talking about judicial systems that are just incredibly weak. In Kenya, magistrates courts still use handwritten notes. There is only one digitized system and that's the system that we provide as, as our platform vcms which is terrible when we learned that on the one hand you're like hooray look what we did we we're the only digitized system in the kenyan magistrates courts but when you think about it it's just completely saddening that that's it and so when you start to look as with tom and sarah said uh, at all these different countries at all the small things that need to be done you look at cox's bazaar trafficking out of there in, in Bangladesh, you think about tunnel migration to Dhaka and Chittagong to go into the apparel industry, mostly women, therefore mostly gender issues that are not looked at. So you have to look at it that that said, then you start to break it down and you say, okay, going taking what Thomas said about force multipliers and, and, and looking for those points that have maximum catalytic effect. If you are smart, you can identify those elements that have far greater gravity and momentum than, than, than others. And you can work on those. And what you don't do is you don't say, I need a billion dollars because I'm going to do a billion things. You need to say, these are the, these are the points at which I'm going to do something. We, we looked at palm oil and we said, we can probably put them in a position where by looking at trade violations and securities, we will create a, a lot of pressure. And yeah, I, I got sued in March as kind of quasi slap suit, which was withdrawn, but it created the pressure to do that. When we look at something like, um, we look at something when I, we've petitioned against the entire apparel industry in the city of Leicester, not necessarily the most popular move to begin with, because it showed that in a Western country, there are still large industries where forced labor is probably allegedly occurring. But we start to have indirect conversations with the local council, started to talk to people and, you know, also questioned where is, where are the local NGOs? Why haven't, why haven't they taken care of this? It's all very interesting doing research in tea in India, but if you should be doing research, and most of you won't know this, but Tom will, in, in Burnley, in Lancashire, then the point is that you should be there as well. If you've got universities in the UK that are looking at that, then you need to be looking at things domestically as well. So it's a question of where resources, as Tom was saying, best applied and what kind of output outcomes and impact you can get from that. You know, the, exactly the stuff that Sarah's doing is incredibly important. And, you know, we go back quite a bit on this and, and I, we started doing this when I was still working back in the 2000s. 
but there really is there really aren't enough NGOs doing that financial work. Sarah stands out by miles as the one person doing this, and you know I'm a big fan of hers. You know, we recently reduced our program on doing this, and basically shut it down because we've been doing it for six or seven years. But there needs to be people who can lead a next generation, and she, you know, you should give money to her. She is that person. So if I took some money. If someone gave me 10 million, I would, yeah, there's some operations I want to do for a million plus over a few years, but I would give most of it away to NGOs on the ground where we need to invest in a new generation of trained activists, not people marauding around the planet with good intention and, as Easterly put it, Kipling's values. We need to have people who are knowledgeable, practice expert, and also purposeful. We don't have, we have a very small number of those in the generation below 45. And Perfect answer. So. Thank you so much. And I want to thank all of our panelists. Sarah, you've shared how to go after the traffickers finances and member of our audiences are going to be inspired by what you and Polaris are doing. Brava. Duncan, thank you for sharing with us how Liberty shared has used US laws to deny US markets for the purpose of changing forced labor practices. Only a few people ever get to make such a positive difference in so many lives. So on behalf of our audience, thank you for the difference you and Liberty Shared are making. And I also want to thank Tom. Tom, you're mobilizing the power of, of money and people of goodwill working together, it really does make you somebody who's a force multiplier. So bravo to you and UBS. And I also want to thank the anti-trafficking organizations that supported this effort by inviting your members to join us. If you're one of the anti-trafficking organizations listed here, and we actually need to go to the next slide, uh, if you're one of the anti-trafficking organizations listed here, we salute you for your boots on the ground effort. Fighting human trafficking takes money and awareness, but it also takes people who are on the ground delivering services, kind of like what Duncan just said. So personally, I have all the admiration in the world for the work that you do. Also, thank you, a great big thank you to the, organization, the organizers of the Fulbright Forum. 75 years ago, Senator Fulbright had a dream of impacting lives in a positive way. With today's forum, we know that Fulbright's dream is not only alive and well, it's a continuing force for good. And finally, the biggest thanks go to you who are watching this. You've given one of your most precious resources, your time. You wanted to learn more about human trafficking and how to stop it. But don't stop with this forum. Your resources are needed. Do you have time, skills, contacts, money? The need is extraordinary and your contribution will make a difference. And we want to hear from you. And I'd like to end with a quote from Martin Luther King. We can all be great because we can all serve. Be part of this effort. Be great, serve. Thank you. <laughs>